he had a pretty good childhood, pretty normal childhood, pretty good childhood. You know, I mean, we bought a house and we did all the things, all the, all the American dream things, but somewhere along the way, he just, I guess, got mixed up with the wrong crowd of people. Jonathan had three siblings. Um, two, two, uh, two sisters and a brother, so, um, who are terribly, terribly heartbroken about all of this. Um, it's a daily struggle to try to deal with how I feel versus, or at the same time, try to manage, you know, feelings they're not, they're not used to feeling. He was like, he was definitely one of my best friends. Um, we were only like a year apart, so we definitely had a lot in common. We were basically just always together, and if it was like him and his friends who were like, hey, can we come here? And we would just like hang out, even if we were doing nothing but on our phones. Um, it was very important to us just to get the quality time together, because on how we were, I always didn't talk to anybody but him because he made me feel safe because he just let me talk. So it was definitely like a best friend relationship we had. He was very uh, caring and he really just wanted to help any and everybody. Um, for I think it was two of his birthdays, he went, made sandwiches and just passed it out to the homeless. And that's all he wanted to do. He didn't ask for anything else but to pass sandwiches out to the homeless so they can eat. He was a huge lover, despite the, the facade he tried to put on. I think what sticks out the most to me is how, how good he is with, or was with babies. Ever since he wasn't a baby anymore, he's like all hands on anybody's baby. Doesn't matter whose baby, what they look like, <laughs> he needs all the babies. And so um, he was just like super, like oddly nurturing. Um, and really, really good at it. All the babies loved, just loved him just as much. He loved babies, like anyone he can get a hold of, he would. Didn't matter if they were dirty or if they were one month or one year or 10 years or like anybody younger than him. He was, I uh, was excited to see him be a dad one day. He would have been a good dad. And he was always just kind of sticking up for the underdog, I guess you could say. Um, those that the new kid at school or the kid that's getting bullied or um, the kid with not as many friends, he would be the one um, that would kind of scoop them up under his wing and carry them across to where they could carry themselves. And he was just really, really caring and he really cared how other people felt around him. I mean, I started smelling weed is really all, um, I, is how it started. I started smelling weed and I'm like, I can smell that stuff these days from a mile away or 10 miles away. Despite him trying to hide it, I could smell it. And, you know, in my head, I was like, well, at least it's just weed. I never expected anything to, for it to go from zero to 60 in a blink like it did. He wouldn't do it in front of anybody. He would kind of just do it on his own. And, like, we knew he was doing it only because we could smell it. And he always thought he was so slick. Like, he would be like, no, nah, I don't smoke. Like, I don't even know what that is. But, like, every, you can smell it from outside the house. He was older than me, and it was kind of like, at least it's just weed and not, like, hardcore drugs. So if him, when he was denying it, I just felt as he was scared to be judged since he doesn't judge anyone. And he, if I was to make a mistake and I, I denied it, he wouldn't. Um, he wouldn't sit there and be like, well, why are you lying? You're lying. So when he was denying it, it was kind of like, he'll come around. So me hearing him deny it, it was kind of just like, oh, he's scared to get judged. So I didn't think too much of it. I kind of just gave him his space. He had stayed home from school one day at my house at the very end of the school year. Um, and... I had security cameras around the house, and I had, he decided he was going to break into my bedroom and go into my closet and spend an hour in there. 
And then he just vanished away from the house. He just left the house. And he wound up getting picked up by a friend. And he, I could watch him on the cameras through the house, and he's just acting funny. And I'm like, what's going on? So I leave work. I go home, and he has now tampered with alcohol or dabbled with alcohol. He drank all my vodka in my closet. And so that was just kind of the, I was like, you need to go to your dad's. You know, maybe he can get a handle on you. So he had been at his dad's for a month when all of this happened. So, but besides the smelling like weed and the getting drunk in my closet uh, when I wasn't home, there wasn't really a change, I would say. It was like, there might be a problem, there is a problem, and then, I mean, it was very, very rapid from the time I noticed that something could possibly be up to the time that he was killed. It was pretty quick, months. After he passed, it was like all his friends just started telling these crazy stories that you wouldn't believe he did. But again, I feel like he showed his true colors to us and then his friends, it was just an act to fit in or like to get them back up on their feet. He was a sophomore and um, it was the very end of the school year, 2022. And um, he had missed quite a bit of school. So this is one of those hindsight things. He had missed quite a bit of school and been pretty sick. Um, I'd find him throwing up in the bathroom, just pale as he wants to be, pale, pale, pale. Headache, migraine, migraine for like weeks. He, had, he didn't go to school like the last two or three weeks of school. On and off fever, and I'm like, what is going on? I've taken him to the children's hospital. I've taken him to his primary care doctor. I've taken him for imaging. You know, I did all the things. That was all leading up to the day he broke into my bedroom. And then after he broke into my bedroom is when he went and stayed with his dad for a month. Um, I had just taken him for imaging scans to try to get to the bottom of this migraine thing. They had diagnosed him with abdominal migraines, which I've never heard of such a thing. Still, not, I'm still not real abdominal migraines. I'm still not real sure if that was just yeah, something that they told me to give me <laughs> to give me a diagnosis or what. But um, we had just went for like an abdomen ultrasound and a chest X-ray. And I dropped him back off um, at his, oh, we took the dog and got the dog's nails trimmed. And he hung out with the girls at the house for a little bit. And then I dropped him back off at his dad's. We were all hanging out and me and him happened to get into an argument or whatever. So we got into this big argument and he leaves. We like, we got along after, but we didn't really say sorry or anything. We kind of just let it go. He was in a great mood, like, I remember looking at my daughter in the, who was sitting in the truck with me as we dropped him off, and it's like, man, he's like his old self. He's, he's super happy, you know? And I was like, man, this is awesome. I hope it stays like this. She's like, right? He was extra nice. Bubba was extra nice. Um, he told us he loved us, hugged us, and went inside. And um, I went home, or we went to Walmart and got him the groceries he requested because he was going to come back over the next day. And um, I go home, everything's good. And in that morning, I went to text him, like, hey, I'm sorry, like, can we talk about it? Because that was our relationship. And I was like, okay, the messages aren't going through. He fell asleep on the phone. And I guess it's about 11.30 the next morning, I get, I get a phone call and it's completely, I can't even understand what's being said on the other end of the line. And it's just lots of screaming. And it's my husband and he's screaming. And I'm like, you're gonna have to calm down. I can't understand what you're saying. And, um, he took a breath and I had heard it, but it just wasn't clicking for some reason. And he said, Jonathan's dead. And she runs in my room and she's like, can you not hear me screaming? I go, no. And I kind of like laugh about it. I'm like, why are you screaming? It's like 11.30, and she goes, Jonathan's dead. I'm like, why are you lying to me? Like, we just saw him last night. Like, it wasn't, we didn't register it as he was dead. And in my head, I'm thinking, keep trying, and I'm even telling him, keep trying, I'm on my way. Like, tell me where to go, I can fix this when I get there, is what I was saying. It's for some reason, I work in healthcare, so for some reason, the shock, I don't know, I thought, just hold on, I'll be there, and then this will be okay. We got in the car, and I still didn't believe it. I was like, okay, y'all are like going insane. Like, he's alive. And if he's not alive, there's a chance we could save him. I went, I loaded my kids up in the car and I'm freaking and I'm going 100 miles an hour, running every red light, 
like flashers on, you know, thinking that I could, if I could just get there in time. And I pull up and the police are standing on the porch and won't let anybody come in. His dad and his stepdad are outside completely distraught. And they said, we're not letting you go in there. You don't need to see him like that. And I'm like, I was so angry. Like, so I, I couldn't understand what was going on. And I'm just like, what is going on? Can't really do anything. It's kind of like you're stuck. Like you can't do anything. It's like your hands are tied and you're trying to fight and you're trying to help, but everyone's just like, you can't help. It's like you feel worthless, like you feel helpless. You can't do anything to help anybody at that point. And it took a minute. It took a minute for it to sink in that like, okay, this is it's already final. And the ambulance had already left and everything. And I didn't realize he was dead until they took his body out of the house covered and basically took him away and my mom was like yeah you have the option to like leave if this is too hard for you you don't have to be here because it, it was during the summer so it was like 90 degrees and it was me and my whole family my dad's side my mom's side and we sat there for hours refusing to leave because that was our family member and we really like cared about him so just the thought of him being dead, I don't think anyone believed it. So we were like, we're staying and we're not leaving until we get to the bottom of this. So basically what happened, what I've been told happened, this is all pending. So um, his dad told me that um, he had overheard him talking about prescription medications that the night that I dropped him off over there. And his dad sat him down and he said, you know, there's this, you know, how do you know, how do you know? How do you know it's not fentanyl? You know, there's, there were news stories on the night, the nine o'clock news that night talking about it. It had just started like being brought into the public on, you know, in the news or whatever. And he, he had, he said, Jonathan, I never heard of fentanyl. And um, he sat him down and told him, you know, you, you don't know, you don't know what you're getting or where you might think you're getting something, but where did those, where did your friend get it from? Or where did your homeboy get it from? And he told him, you know, don't, don't be doing that. And Jonathan swore up and down he wouldn't. They went to bed. His dad went to go wake him up the next morning, like at 11 o'clock for a job interview. It was going to be his first job. He had his first job interview. And he said he, he was, he, his dad's one of those pranksters. He's always messing with the kids in their sleep and like annoying them and like picking on them. And so he went and did his thing and he's like, boy, get up, you know? And he said, when he hit his leg, he's like, like it, it he said it was just like whacking the cinder block. And so he grabbed him and he's like, Jonathan, he tried to grab him. And he said, as soon as he grabbed him, he knew he was gone. And, um, that's when I got the call shortly after that, after they called 911. And so there, of course, we're all getting interviewed. The you know, that morning, we're all getting interviewed and we're sitting in the detective's trucks one at a time and getting grilled. And I'm the, you know, and his dad had told me all of these things about the conversation the night before and all of that. And so I, of course, shared that with the detective, you know, and he's like, does he do drugs? And I, well, he smells like weed all the time, <laughs> you know? I mean, whatever you need to know. And so we were, once we started having that conversation with the detectives, in my head it clicked, and I'm like, I bet, and I even said it out loud, I bet, I bet this was fentanyl. And I'm like begging the detective, please, please have the coroner test him for it, please, as if it wasn't going to be. Um, but at that time, it still wasn't a huge, a widely known thing. Like, I had heard about it maybe once or twice in passing, like on the news, but it wasn't like it is today, where it's on every single news segment. From then on, it was in my head, with, without the toxicology report, it was in my head that that's what happened to him. And we got the toxicology report back uh, five weeks and five days later, and it confirmed, um, it confirmed what I had suspected. So what I've heard, and again, this is still an open investigation, so I haven't, I haven't spoken to the authorities who know what happened yet about this. But what I've heard is that um, Snapchat facilitated a conversation with an adult who brought over um, what was supposed to be and looked exactly like a Percocet. 
Jonathan went in the room, apparently, and took it and fell asleep and never woke up. They actually conducted a search warrant on one of the suspect's homes that very night that my son passed away. And I don't know if that's because Jonathan was 15 or if it's because I was very pressing about the issue, about, hey, this is what his guardians have heard him saying, you know, just the night before. These are the names that we heard. This is, here's his phone, <laughs> you know. I'm not real, or if it's because it's, be it's becoming the new thing to, to be more, to prosecute more heavily on these things. I'm not sure why we have the opposite experience, but they definitely took it serious. They've been very tight-lipped, though, the entire last 13 or 14 months that this has been going on. Very tight-lipped, and so um, we're gearing up for trial, but, you know, my, my factual information is limited until then. I'm doing okay. Um, I would, it doesn't, get, it never gets better, but it definitely gets easier to control yourself and control when you're going to cry or whatever, but it does get easier to live for him or live for your family, knowing that that's what he would want. And it definitely gets easier knowing that he's watching over us and he didn't really mean to die. Like, it was out of the blue when he died. So I feel like I'm only doing better knowing that we will get justice for him and knowing my mom's by my side and she will never do anything to harm us or put us in pain. So just having her there helps a lot. Um, so with my mom's help, I feel like I'm doing better than what I was in the beginning. I think I've learned some, some very unique, um, unique life lessons from all of this, things that I think that others probably go their whole lives and never learn. Uh, my priorities are a lot different. Um, things I used to find, you know, joy in are completely irrelevant. Um, materialistic things, irrelevant. Because at the end of the day, you know, even even arguments and, like, you know, confrontation with, with loved ones, irrelevant. Because, like I said, jo Jonathan and I had been button heads because he broke into my room and got drunk when I was at work. And so we had been kind of on the outs a month prior to his passing. Thankfully, we made amends that day before when he came to the house. The argument we got into was because I was moving into his room. So I kicked him out of his room and he saw me moving all his stuff out. Um, and it was all fine, but the like it was like an hour before he died, I finished moving all my stuff in and I finally went to bed. As soon as I got done, he just, I found out he died, so it kind of, I was kind of like disappointed. I was like, why do, why did I do this? Like, now I don't have any, any of his stuff in his room that he basically lived in. But at the end of the day, none of that mattered. Him breaking into my room didn't matter. Him smoking weed didn't matter. What mattered was how I spent my time with him and how I loved him and how he loved me and his siblings. That's what really matters. The rest of it's just water under the bridge. <laughs> yeah. So we spend our time differently now. <laughs> I'm way more present with my other kids. Attentive, just there, you know. So I never thought that's what, um, first of all, I never thought I'd be standing over the body of my son, but, um, and I've lost, I've lost other people in my life, but I've never had this like epiphany, um, this whole time management thing and this whole, you know, how, how did you love in your lifetime? Um, never had that epiphany until Jonathan passed away. And now it's like, I'm like hyper-focused on not having to ever feel that way again. 